Marcus, good evening. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast tonight. Uh, good evening. Fantastic opportunity. I'm very grateful. Yes, I'm very grateful uh, to have you here. And uh, I will admit something uh, to you, though, Marcus. Uh, this is kind of a, a selfish thing inviting you on here because I've had um, a couple of thoughts as of late, and I think you're kind of sort of the man that I to talk to to sort of kind of like I help me sort out what's going through my head right now. But I think it kind of it. It kind of goes without saying right now that the world is um, a little bit crazy at the moment. We have things like rising inflation and being an election year here in the U.S. You know, we got some political strife going on. And, you know, with the rise in inflation, like uh, groceries cost more, gas costs more. I think I'm hearing about like, uh, you know, people having to skip meals because they can't afford groceries anymore as much as they used to in the past. So I feel like there's a tinge of desperation in the air. And I feel like when people get desperate, logic and reason kind of takes a backseat as does patience. So I almost kind of get the fear that if I bump into someone wrong or look at a glance in someone's direction the wrong way that, you know, I could potentially rile them up or just maybe, you know, burn out what's left of their short few. So I feel like maybe there's a propensity for uh, violence maybe in this day and age than more so than in the past. But I was kind of hoping to maybe get your thoughts on that just to kind of start things off here. Well, uh, and my, my, my optics are a little different perhaps than most, you know, I've been blessed to make it to 55 and in the last, you know, 10 years, I think we should just keep everything in perspective. When, all the verbiage you just used, we've had nothing is new. Political strife since we had politics, there's been political strife. Um, you know, from the Great Depression up, we've had peaks and valleys of times where things are really bad and really good. And it reminds me of I was in uh, I was in an airport, can't remember which one, and I never look at the news. Right when I'm in an airport, I just don't. And for whatever reason, I got caught up on it. And it was it was just in the middle of COVID or near, it was in the time of COVID. And I don't know why. I was just like, oh, I can't believe how bad our life is and the world. And it just got real negative. And there was a beautiful woman. I don't know. She might have been, I don't want to insult her, but she might have been 70, 80. And I said, ma'am, can you believe how bad things are right now? And I just, and she just looked over and she was so sweet. She put her hand on me. She was, honey. You guys have it so good right now. And I looked at her like I was like, seriously, like she had three heads. And I said, how can you say that? And she goes, again, she goes, honey, you guys have it great. It's not that bad. Everything's going to be all right. And I had this sense of peace because I was getting caught up in the, I don't want to say the lies because it's my lie is somebody else's truth, but I got caught up in the engine of fear, right? The fear-based comments and fear-based reporting. And yeah, things are, things are, people are going through some tough times. People are always going through tough times. The uh, inflation and people going without food. There's now, you know, you depend on your argument. There's people that go without food every day. There's kids that are in our school systems right now that the only food they get is when they go to school at lunch and the school pays for their for their breakfast and lunch. It's the only food they'll get in their day. So when somebody comes up and says something about, you know, how bad things are, I need to look at things on a big scale. Yes, things are not great. However, this country still has it better than a significant amount of the population. And I'm not saying, and I don't want to compare because comparison is the thief of, of everything. However, embrace what you do have. And more importantly, are we helping those within our country so that they don't have to go out? You know, what have you done with the food bank? You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity to help our fellow Americans that isn't being done. I'm not going to blame the government because the government's job is to to just <laughs> look in the, I look in the dictionary or thesaurus under honest politician and there'll be a blank entry. You just can't trust them, right, brother? So and when and you brought up something really and it's important that we we deal with this. You made a good point about people being on their last nerve and you're cautious about upsetting them. 
And this is where, I mean, this is my job, right? I teach people how to protect themselves. And the biggest thing is to not live in that fear. Look, man, if somebody goes and you bump into them and let's say your cart hits their car or something and they freak out, you're like, you know what? You're right. I was absolutely wrong. I apologize. My bad. What can I do to, to make this right? Or de-escalation is really the art of being hu humble, owning your mistake. And if they do cross the line and they're like, you know what? And they're just looking for the opportunity to pick the fight. Just, you know, simple words, buddy, I know you're pissed. I know you're upset. Is there anything I can do to fix this right now? No, go F yourself. Okay. Well, God bless you. Be careful. Don't, don't stay angry. And then, and then leave the situation. Right. Yeah. World's always gonna have, it, it, the sky's never falling. No matter how much they want to report that it is, the sky is never falling. We are taken care of. Everything's going to be all right. Look, be grateful. First of all, if people lived in gratitude, this is a little judgy, and I forgive me if it is, but if people truly lived in a sense of gratitude, being grateful for what they have, you would find less people um, be so open about their dislike of how bad our country is. Right. You know, because um, I think um, in this day and age, especially with uh, technology, social media, 24 hour news cycle, it's very easy for many people to get caught up in that. And, you know, I'm guilty of that uh, just as well, too. And, you know, probably that even is shown with my opening uh, question there that, you know, sometimes I even allow myself to get caught in that rabbit hole. But, you know, it's a double edged sword. I mean, obviously, with social media you and I got connected this way and we're able to make this podcast happen and bring uh, this information that we're going to discuss today, today to the masses. But, um, you know, I, I haven't told you yet, but I'm an archaeologist by day. That's, that's my profession. So obviously I like to look at the lens of uh, our human past and what it was like for people hundreds and thousands of years ago, you know, hundreds and a hundred years ago, a th couple thousand years ago, if something happened on the other side of the world, or maybe even happened just a hundred miles away from you are, would you ever have known about it? Were you ever meant to know about it? It's just, you know, the main thing that was uh, so important was just what was in your vicinity, what was going on within your own tribe, your own family. And that's where your focus lied. Now, so nowadays, everyone's so worried about, you know, conflicts in Ukraine, conflicts in the Middle East, and they don't even know who their next door neighbors are. So, no. um, so I think, yeah, so I think that's probably something for us to be aware of is that, you know, I, it's important to be informed about things, but not let ourselves get consumed by them, I'd say. And I agree with you. And I think that there's so like social media is not, and I've been, I've been harsh on social media. I've said some mean things about social media. Social media is what you make of it. Right. If you are constantly searching out things that are laced in fear or negativity or just not healthy for you, then what do you think your brain's going to think? Right. And so I am thankful for social media. Like you said, we wouldn't be talking right now if it wasn't for social media. But like everything, we have a responsibility for how our how we handle technology. And and again, fear, man, fear, fear, fear. Oh, oh, no, no, no. It's not that bad. You don't like something, swipe, right? Not swipe right, because that's a whole different topic here. We'll leave that right <laughs> Swipe correct. I mean, you. if anybody listening to this, I hope that the, our conversation soothes the fear that you feel like the world is imploding and that it's just so bad. It's not. And worst case scenario, go look at dog videos. The one thing the internet's good for, you got dog videos, cat videos, you got animal videos, you got all sorts of cool things going on. Look at nature, look at the waterfalls, look at sunrises, look at the things that people have captured with technology in a beautiful way and embrace that. And just let the, let the cycle of nonsense go. You know, if you're sitting in front of a TV screen or you're in front of your phone screen, you know, eight hours a day, what are you doing for that other eight or 10 or 15 hours? Like, what are you ingesting that will balance that out? And I'm hoping this conversation will cause people to be not feeling judged or condemned, but, oh, 
okay, yeah, just options, man, just options. Well, to go off of something that a mutual friend of ours once said, uh, Jack Carr, I mean, uh, uh, a reoccurring story element in his books, the James Reese series, uh, he talks about time and that, you know, time is fleeting and it's something that none of us can outrun and we'll never get it back. And of course, he's very deliberate with making sure that those who invest their time into reading his books get the best experience uh, possible. So going to with your point, though, it's that yeah, when we allow ourselves to just consume so much of our day with the negativity on the 24 hour news cycle on social media, engaging in like, you know, these fruitless arguments with people we don't know that don't lead anywhere. I think to myself, if I'm going to be on my deathbed, you know, when I'm 104, because I intend to live that long, mm -hmm. it's like, would I really feel proud of myself? Or like, would I really just wish that man, I wish I had one more day to just scroll through Instagram one more time. Or I really wish I had one more day just to like troll people in, um, in the comment section and argue with them. It's like, no, I would w I would kill to have one more day with my loved ones, with my family, with my friends, or to just have enough youthless, uh, youthful vigor to go do that activity that I always love. It's just, so it's like, what are your priorities with the limited time that you do have? And I don't think that fighting with strangers on the internet and getting caught up in that stuff is a very, you know, meaningful way to spend the limited time we have. Well, and everybody thinks they've got all the time until they find out just how little they really do have. And, uh, and again, you know, we're, we take things for granted so easily, you know, we, you and I are, let's just leave technology, but you and I are talking, right. And you can hear me and you can see me, correct? We're, we're on the same page. Yes. There are people, men and women, children who aren't, don't have access to speak. They don't have access to hearing. They don't have access to eyesight. There's people that are right now, you know, and, and now as I say that, it's meant as a, you um, enjoy it because, you know, their life is so bad. It's not. They don't have bad lives. If you talk to most people who have some kind of a disability or a challenge, you know, yeah, they got their bitching and moaning just like we do. But for the most part, they live in gratitude. Because they're grateful for what they do have and they don't squawk and complain about what they don't have. And that's the biggest lesson that I will sit there and preach for the la until my last breath. It ain't what you got, don't got. What do you got? What are you doing with what you do got? Don't compare yourself to the other person. Comparison is a thief of joy, man. And that is the truest statement I think I've ever heard. Stop comparing. Enjoy your life. Yeah. And when I think it comes to being things that having things that we're grateful for, um, a lot of th things that I like to try to encourage from people is just simply start with the basics more than anything else. It's like, did you wake up this morning and did you look up at a ceiling instead of a sky? So, you know, you have shelter. Did you go um, to your kitchen where you have a water faucet that you can turn on and have seemingly endless amount of, of clean uh, water at your disposal? It's like, do you have a fridge and maybe like some cupboards and a pantry stocked with foods that you chose for yourself because you wanted those foods, not because it was just simply by necessity? And if someone is listening to us, um, like either in the podcast or watching the YouTube video, if they have a device that allows them to do so, I'm going to assume that they have those basics covered. And just simply knowing that, I think, is um, a very good start and a, a lot of things to be grateful for right from the get-go to really just start their day on a very positive note. And if you got your basic needs covered, well, you're good to take on anything else that comes your way, really. Agreed. And, you know, you, it's, I just think it's, it, it amuses me how <clears throat> we're, as human beings, we, we just will not appreciate what we have until it's taken from us. Right. Number one blessing that we will ever get, you know, waking up is the first blessing, right? You've got to wake up. Now, if you're able to have a bowel movement without a bag or somebody helping you, if you're able to walk down the street, I'm not talking about doing some CrossFit special or, you know, hiking Mount Kilimanjaro, but if you can walk and, and just take a sniff and listen, like, I, you know, Youth is wasted on the young, has been said a million times. And it's true because we just don't appreciate it as young people. We just don't understand how important health, health 
is. Health is the number one gift. Aside from my faith, right, like right underneath faith is health. Because health, and I'm talking about mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, anything that has an O at the end of it, you know, is, is health. After that, it's, it's a mix. Some people have jobs, family, whatever. Start investing in your health. And it's never too late. It's never too late. I mean, I, I shouldn't say it's never too late, but um, I'd rather hear somebody say that they were 75 and they started um, walking and doing some body weight exercises and they lived to 77. At least those last two years, they were giving it a shot, right? They didn't quit. They didn't give up. And as you mentioned, Jack Carr, good man, I love him to death. Never tell me the odds. If you've read his books, you understand that part. Right. Right. Never tell me the odds. Don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. Absolutely. And uh, w- another th- message that I bring up frequently on this podcast is your body is the vessel with which you will do all things. And if you have it running optimally, at least, you know, to the best of your ability, then all other areas of your life are just naturally going to improve. You know, you're going to improve like as a spouse, as a parent, as a family member, as a friend, in your job, in your business, you know, wherever it is you're expected to show up. If you're dialing in your health to the best of your ability, then you're just going to excel in all those areas. And giving yourself permission to understand that, you know, my, my big thing, my big thing is love people where they're at, not where you want them to be. And that starts with you. Love myself where I'm at, not where I think I should be or where I want to be. Love where, where you're at right now. And it's and you, you're just taking steps forward, baby steps, man. One step back, three steps forward, four steps back, three steps forward. Just move forward. And as you said, because the word, the optimum is subjective to where you are at this very moment. Maybe, maybe where you're the listener right now, I can't do a push-up. Or can you do a wall push-up? I can do a wall push up. Okay, then when you get to 10 wall push ups, try one modified push up. Because optimal is when you're trying to do the best you can at the present moment, this second that you're at. That's optimal. As long as you don't compare and you don't sit there and say, well, I'm not like my next door neighbor or I'm not like the guy I see on, on Instagram and he's doing it with a weight vest and all, just let it go where you're at. And that's what matters where you're at right now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, right now. That's all that matters. Right. And I think having that uh, discernment, I think that plays well into another point that you brought up uh, earlier. You were talking about de-escalation. If you are in, in, in encountered with uh, someone uh, that may be on the aggressive side. Uh, I actually kind of have a story uh, from just this past week where something like that happened. And I kind of had to sort of just collect myself uh, a little bit and again, not allow myself to just, you know, get too caught up in it It just as well too. So I was sitting in my car in the parking lot of an HEB and um, I see um, there was a pickup truck that was parked just kind of kitty corner from me. And uh, a guy comes out from the cab, from the cab, he walks in front of my car, comes to my uh, driver's side window. And he says to me, um, your uh, headlights are looking a little bit uh, foggy there. It's like, uh, if you'd like, um, I, I clean I clean headlights. And so um, if you'd like, I can clean them for you, get them nice and shiny. And I said, well, that's okay. I appreciate I appreciate it, man, but no thank you. And then, you know, he insisted on it. He's like, I, I can tell you, it won't, it won't take very long. We'll get it nice and clean for you. And I just it once again said, well, no thanks, man. I'm good. And then he's like, okay. But then as he walks uh, past uh, the front of my car, Marcus, he says, uh, he does this little thing where he says, I'm good, man. Thanks for the offer. Like in a very, very mocking tone. Mm-hmm. And a part of me wanted to get out of the car and just be like, dude, what's your problem? Who yeah. do you think you are talking to me like that? You know, I could see you from the front window. But then um, but then the the logical side of myself kicked in and, and said, you know, he's probably in desperation mode right now. I mean, obviously, if he's uh, trying to find um, a job on the spot where he can make some money, he's probably hurting for it right now. And at the end of the day, it's just like, uh, you know, him saying those things to me, it's like, of course, I remember it since I'm bringing it up in this conversation. But that but his words are not something that I lose sleep over. It doesn't really affect like my day. So I think also just making sure I don't escalate the situation myself even further than what it already was. So that's why I think, you know, just having that discernment and just, you know, 
because I'm obviously like, you know, any man or any person doesn't like to be talked up, like be, be spoken to that way. But, uh, you know, that you, logic and reason has to kind of be at the forefront of your mind when those situations arise. Agreed. And, and, you know, as you said, you said that he's, you know, obviously in a position that he's looking for a job and you made these, you made it a compassionate and an empathetic statement, right? Now, yet, now let's take that just a little bit further. He dropped his pride. I'm, and I'm putting things into, into his mouth. I don't know. Maybe not. But he dropped his pride, asked somebody for something, and was rejected. Okay? Right. No matter what. You can say whatever you want. Well, you were polite about it, and we we're all polite about it. At the end of the day, from his, his optics and his shoes, I have no money. I'm willing to do this thing. I'm, I'm groveling and I got rejected. I'm upset that I got rejected. So I'm going to mock this guy because really it's about me and I'm upset and, and I feel ashamed. Right. Right. So, you know, when it's, I really do wish that people would not just walk a, a mile in somebody's shoes, but just get our heads out of our butts and remember that everybody is going through something and we have no idea. We have no idea how close to the edge anybody really is. Right. Right. Um, And, you know, I just, I'm drawn to the fact that you had empathy in your thoughts as you were speaking afterwards, you know, the mocking and, and all that, like, like that's the last ditch effort of anybody to, to, to when they have no retort, they go and we, we say stupid shit, right? We, we do a stupid act. And that's because of the fact that we're usually embarrassed. Most of the time a fight happens is because one guy or one girl is embarrassed at something and they have no other choice but to do whatever it is that they feel they have to do physically. Right. Right. And that's where security comes from. Real security is when you're like, yep, I, I totally own that. That was my bad. Right. Absolutely. Now it takes, it takes a certain, a certain way of being to be able to do that. Right. And now I'm sure you've been around men or women who are, they have the capacity to snatch the soul right out of you. Certainly. Right? And for the most part, those people, <laughs> you got to you gotta poke that bear pretty hard for them to sit there and do it because they understand the end result of what's going to happen. Most of us, most human beings have no idea what it's like because they've been lied to that they have all the right to do whatever they're going to do. But there's a repercussion, there's consequences for our actions, consequences for our words, consequences for it all. And I and I, I applaud any man or woman who can just sit there and be like, it's just not worth it. You know, it's just not it's just not worth it. I've had people that come up and they're like, you're a, you know, fill in the blanks, right? And I'm like, yeah, you saw the video too. Yeah, that was me. Yep, you're absolutely right. Okay, you know, and I say this, it's it's easier said than done. The hardest part to teach regular people is aggression because most people really aren't aggressive. Okay. They're just not, no matter what they tell everybody on the internet. And the, the confidence inside to be able to be humble and, and, and have some humility to not escalate an already escalated situation. And Human beings, you know, at some point in time, that's why you're seeing a lot of people who are just doing stupid things and their life, their life is gone now. They're going to be in jail for 10, 15 years because of 3.2 seconds of a bad, bad decision. Right? Right. Anyways, I got on a little tangent there. Moving on. <laughs> well, of course, um, this is kind of a world that you've... um. I don't know if um, immersed is the right word, but maybe involved would probably be a better word that you, you've you been involved in with a good part of your life. Um, you've been a martial artist for decades uh, now at this point. And, and I think the style, if it's, 
even really considered a style. Krav Maga is what you focus much of that on. But of course, there was a lot that came before that just as well, too. So could you kind of take us back a little bit here and kind of tell us um, how your martial arts journey began? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been doing this 45 years, right? So it's been and and everything has been rooted, not everything. I began my my martial arts journey based in fear because I was getting my ass kicked, right? So, you know, you think you're going to go and do some cool moves, karate kid it, and, you know, you're still getting your butt kicked. It doesn't really <laughs> matter. Um, but that was like everyone's been given gifts from the Lord and, and I have a gift for, for martial arts and I have a gift for teaching regardless of how many years and decades I fought it. Um, and martial arts, because I was not athletic. I was not, you know, just didn't have that. A lot of it has to do with confidence, but I didn't have that athletic ability to be able to cool, you know, football, soccer, you know, all that stuff. And martial arts was just a great escape. I was able to escape my, my life that I was in, uh, and and that was my one go to, you know. And then that spills into nightclub security. Do that for twenty years, so now you've got a whole plethora of seeing people at the very worst of their life. Put that with martial arts, and then you get, and then you have your own insecurities and fears, and then all sorts of use, all sorts of stupid things. But the martial arts has been my identity for you know forty five years. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a good journey. It's been a good journey. Now, I know that once uh, Krav Maga came into the picture for you, you actually went to Israel for a good time uh, to do this. Uh, when did that sort of uh, take place in the timeline of your life? And, you know, how long were you there for? And yeah, kind of fill us in on the details uh, with uh, that part of your journey. Well, two, 2005. Um, so, I don't know, I was in my late 30s. Um through a whole bunch of very, very interesting coincidences. Um, I was able to meet my instructor and then go and stay with him in Israel for 30 days to do my instructor course, um, just him and I. And that, so that's blessing number one. Um, training in Israel is, uh, was my first, not even first international flight. It was my first flight ever. So, uh, Really, wow. but definitely my first international flight. Um, and so I was I was in Israel on and off from 2005 till about 2020, just before COVID. Um, I haven't been back since, but uh, yeah, I, I lived there for over a year. Uh, and it's it is definitely a, a second home. And Krav Maga is just one of those things that it's meant for everybody, right? Like you have some very athletic people on this planet who can do any type of martial art and just be good at it. And you have people, men and women who, how they're able to walk and talk at the same time is a small miracle. Krav Maga is perfect for that second group. It's super easy to learn, super easy to replicate and able to do under stressful situations. And uh, it just, with everything that I went through in traditional martial arts, Krav Maga just fit me. It just fit me. And, and definitely it was, a, it was a God thing, me going to Israel, that just everything that happened. It, and I wasn't acknowledging it back then. I had no clue at all about that. Um, but yeah, Krav Maga is the business, man. So it's been a great part of my, uh, my, this part of my life, this last, this last part, I can't believe I said that, this section of my age the last 20 years is almost 20 years. It's been pretty fantastic. You know, I, I'm actually um, a Krav Maga student myself. Um, I have uh, done some training uh, when I was living in England. Um, I went to grad school there. Uh, this was back in like uh, 2016, 2017 timeframe is uh, when I was living in England. And um, the academy I trained at was called Spartans Academy of Krav Maga. And uh, they get their lineage from Itai Gil. And so uh -huh. um, definitely had uh, a good experience there. But now, I, similar to you, I have dabbled into uh, traditional martial arts styles in the past. I, I am a Tang Soo Do Karate Black Belt. And uh, one of the big differences that I noticed um, after my first uh, Krav Maga class was that there was no 
pretty katas where like um you know obviously when i did traditional martial arts if my uh my blocks and my stances were not perfect um you know my my uh, sensei would tell me to go back and do them again and everything like that to make sure that my form was good but there was very little of, of that in any of the Krav Maga techniques <laughs> that I was being taught. Like, and I told my instructor this, I'm like, yeah, none of this was pretty like at all or, or anything like that. And he says, well, um, uh, if, if it's pretty, it's not Krav Maga. <laughs> so, and, and I think at that point I was kind of hooked at, um, right around there. <laughs> yeah. And he was 100% on point. Definitely, definitely. If, if you're doing it pretty, there's, there's something you're not doing. You're not doing. You're not doing it right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, and so, have you have you started any training in uh, where this the city that you're in? Um, not not currently. And that was. And I'm glad you asked because that was sort of uh, the question I wanted to get into uh, next. Uh, now, the way that m my academy was run over there in England, um, you know, much like how many Israelis are very direct to the point and everything like that, you know, no messing around, no BS, just uh, all, all business like that's really um, how. Uh, George Hussar, that was my instructor. That's how he ran um, all of our training sessions, very direct and to the point. You know, there wasn't really a whole lot of room for like laughter and goofing off and horseplay or anything like that. And then um, I remember one of the drills that I remember the most was when I see him, he's in the corner of uh, the training uh, area center and he's getting all padded up and like, you know, the heavy protective armor, the face mask, the whole kit and caboodle. And he's coming around to each one of us individually. And he has one of those uh, like shock knives, like those stun oh, yeah. knives. Oh, and yeah. Um, yeah, so we each had to take turns just like yeah, trying to do a knife disarm. And he was telling us, hit me as hard as you possibly can, but do this right. And um, I was able to I successfully uh, do the disarm with slightly being stabbed i will admit but once it was all over uh which it was probably over in maybe like two seconds tops you know my heart was just beating through my chest you know i felt like i just sprinted up a mountain and um but of course that's what he was he was trying to deliberately get that response from us like that stress inoculation and everything like that and when i came back stateside uh marcus uh i have tried like krav maga in like other places like uh when i was traveling uh for my first pro professional sin as an archaeologist. And I remember I went to an academy here and there was a few red flags, I, um, I, I will say. And, um, and then, you know, maybe, maybe you can help me shine, help me shine some light on this. But our opening warm up was like this game where we each had to take like a, um, a striking mitt and place it on our hands above our head like this, like, like a, like we're a server at a restaurant. And then we had to like, shuffle around like areas on the mat and we had to try to knock other people's uh you know pad over and so it was a we were our warm-up was a game and um also the instructors and some of the students there had belts which i haven't seen like like belts as in like traditional martial arts which i haven't seen in krav maga up to this point i mean i knew that there were certain rankings amongst different federations but i never saw them in the forms of colored belts before so um Part of me wondered if that when Krav Maga maybe came over an ocean, if it might have gotten slightly watered down in the process. So I think it's been hard to try to find like another academy just because, you know, my frame of reference was how I started when I was uh, in England at this academy. So um, so, uh, so I'm kind of maybe also curious to get your thoughts on that is um, when it, when like money's involved and it becomes a business, does it kind of get watered down to be more inclusive, I guess I'll say? Well, I... I'm going to say this, that in America, in America, we have men and women who come to do a martial art and it's, and it's, it is for self-defense, but it's also for whatever their motivation is. Their motivation may start as, as self-defense and then it becomes a place to go and be social or it becomes an, ex, uh, an extension of their house where they can sit there and make friendships. Um, I don't believe the term watering down. The problem I have with watering down is really if the instructor is not motivated to doing things that are going to save or improve their odds 
in a violent altercation, then yeah, we got some challenges there. You know, Krav Maga has, has got one purpose, only one purpose. Um, and that's to survive an altercation. That's it. It's only purpose. It has no um, hit, counter, the four rules are simple. Deal with the threat, counterattack as soon as possible, disarm, disengage, disarm or disengage, escape. Four rules. That's it. So that's all Krav Maga is. Four rules. Now, as a business, you know, you got to, you got to maintain, and I've had a school, right? Me and my second wife, we had a school in Saginaw, uh, out in Fort Worth. You know, it's, uh, it's difficult because people say they want to do something. And then when you do do something, then all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, I got bruises and it's not as much fun. So there's a, there's a very razor's edge balance to intense training and securing them to be able to come do some training and go to work or go home and not, and not be busted up. And it's a, it's a, it's a difficult, both sides of the, the spectrum. One hates the other. You're, you don't know what it's like to run a business. You're hurting your people. They don't come and train the other people. You guys are a bunch of pansies. And so my takeaway is to, it's a scale and you need to, throw in enough stress inoculation and what have you to cause them distress and let them see where their mistakes are in a safe environment. Cause really the adage for most schools should be die a thousand times on the mat. So you can live one time on the street. Mm. So you should be making a ton of mistakes in here, laughing about it and having fun and, and enjoying the process of violence. And what violence brings to you and how you deal with violence. Um, but now that being said, I, that's my job for, for 10 years. My job was to certify men and women and becoming instructors and doing seminars and rank testing and all that. So, you know, my, my viewpoint's a little different than other people. And this is why I try my best to sit there and, and take people now and just say, look, when violence comes, you're never going to be the same again. Choose how much of that change is going to be something that you can live with and what you can't live with. Because it's up to you. How you deal with when violence comes to visit you will be different than how I do it or how somebody else does it. And it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong because you're the one who has to live with you. My job as the instructor is to make sure that you have as many options as possible to apply violence when violence comes and create the opportunity for escape. That's it. And creating the opportunity for escape changes due to a whole bunch of dynamics. I can't give you one answer. I can give you one solution. However, you uh, by yourself, okay. Now, what if you have a child with you? Okay, like, there's a whole bunch of other things that that it's unfair to tell the listener, okay, a knife comes, you do a 360, you counterattack with a shot or a hit or something, you kick them in the groin, and you run away. Okay, that's great. That's a great answer. Now, what happens when I got somebody on my right hand, holding on to my right hand as I get stabbed? What am I supposed to do? Yank my hand away? Poor child's already, you know, like, this is the, what Krav Maga, what should be happening in Krav Maga schools is, okay, we have the problem. We know what the solution is. Now we have to uh, look at what is apl applicable for the person doing it, because not everybody is going to be able to do the moves as we want them at this moment, at this moment, subject to change, right? Sometimes a woman may not want to sit there and, and, and strike. Maybe she doesn't want to kick in the groin, right? So she, what, she's a loser. She's, she's, she's a, a bad person because she can't do it at that point. No, my job as the instructor is to give her options so she can grow into a person that says, okay, I'm not going to be afraid of violence any longer. That's the goal of, of, I know that's for all martial arts school, but I'm just speaking about Krav Maga, you know, and, and so when you're a school owner, how do you find the right match when you got 20 people in a class you got five savages. You got six people who are kind of, you know, they're just, they just, they enjoy the sweat. 
And the leftovers are all guppies, man. They 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 have no idea what's going on. They're here because they don't want to they don't know what to do with violence and they're scared and they thought that this they saw it on the TV that this would help. You can't sit there and, you know, the the hard part is juggling and still making everybody feel educated and edified and empowered. So, I have some empathy for for schools here in North America. Uh, or really around the world outside of Israel, because, yeah, it's it's not the same. You don't have ongoing attacks. Israel, you know, you're doing knife attacks in school, in a, in a school, because the, the threat of a knife attack in real life is is very serious. Right. And I, I think that kind of goes along with, uh, you know, the point that you brought up about, you know, being able to adapt to like the situations that you may face, or maybe even I'll say the environment that you operate in. I mean, of course, you know, here in the U.S., of course, we have the Second Amendment and, you know, people have the right to conceal carry in most states uh, here in the U.S. Uh, like when I go to Europe uh, later this year, I'm not going to have that option. I can't, you know, bring my my pistol and carry it concealed uh, over there. And you know, I travel light. I only travel with a carry on, so I can't bring a blade and, you know, any of this other like tactical weaponry either. And so, um, so I have to adapt accordingly, uh, just as well too. So I know like tools, like whatever tools you're able to carry in certain environments weigh into this, uh, just as well too. Um, now I want to go back to what you mentioned. You said that there was four primary objectives of Krav Maga and forgive me that I can't name them all uh, right offhand, but the one I do certainly remember is to escape. And mm -hmm. um, now, would you say that these fall in any particular order? Because I almost mm -hmm. would feel like escape would be first, if if possible. Well, and well, they they go in that order because of the the because there is a timeline to violence, right? Okay. There's a timeline to violence, meaning you and I are walking down the street and we see the scary people, uh, you know, thirty, forty, fifty feet in front of us. Well. We're going to make a choice to go to the left or right and not go towards the, the scary part, right? Avoidance, awareness, situational awareness, most abused word that we have in my industry. <laughs> um, so, so that, that is a, it's not escaping. It's, it's making a decision that benefits you and I for safety. Now, as we get closer to that problem, our tools will have available to deal with the threat, the very first thing will be different. Now, you know, I know I'm in, we live in Texas and, you know, everyone's quick to the draw and I got my own opinions on that. You know, um, it's great to carry. I love the fact that we have that second amendment and I will fight tooth and nail to keep that second amendment, but pulling a weapon isn't always the best option, right? Your environment. Um, but little things like, uh, you know, bags and, and chairs and just common objects that you can use to keep the space between you and the bad person to escape, right? So again, the, the escape part's always there. It's what can I do to create the opportunity to escape? And as the violence gets closer and closer and closer and closer, my tools to use will change as well. I'm at a kicking distance. I'm now at a at a striking distance. I'm at an elbow distance. I'm at a headbutt distance. I'm at a biting distance. I'm at knees, right? Um, the closer things get, the less my options are, and I need to become, you know, biting at the end is, you know, the carnal savage part, batshit crazy, right? I do something. We get some space. I got enough space to go. I take off. So escape is always going to be there. But it always comes after, after the where the threat is. Whether it's 50 feet away, oh, there's a threat. Well, I don't need to counterattack because there's no attack. I don't need to disarm or disengage. I'm already far enough away, so I'm just going to escape. And as we get closer, I just have to use the right tool for the right situation, follow those other rules and escape. Escape is always going to be there, but it's always the end result. It's always going to be at the end. Because for the most part, for the most part, real attacks are always on the receiving end. Not We're not proactive. Because proactive, we just escape. Right? If we were proactive every single time, oh, there's a danger, there's a danger, I just walk away. I'm just There's my escape. I, I take off. 
most of our attacks are on the receiving end. And that's where, oh, oh, I'm screwed. Do some kind of movement. I got some space. Take off. Now, I want to ask a little bit about like, again, God forbid that anyone listening uh, to this um, get themselves in a violent situation, or maybe even some who are listening probably maybe already have. Um, yes. would, would you have any advice for like the aftermath? Because another point that you brought up is that if you are someone who is involved in a violent situation, you know, your life is different forever. You know, it's like, it's, it's hard to like let go of the fact that something like that just happened to you. Right. And sometimes it could even be dragged out. Like if you had to defend yourself, now you're in the courtroom and you know, this memory is constantly being played on back to you by, you know, people who weren't there and they pass their judgment and everything like that. So, right. so like mentally, would you have any advice for someone who may be having to deal with the aftermath of something like that? And this is why we, we want to try to make good decisions. Because right. if I have really defended myself, right, I've defended myself, and now I'm going to court and I have to prove my innocence, the damage done to me, which no matter what, you're going to, you're not walking away unscathed. Okay, so there's the damage that I have to myself, there's the damage I've given to someone else, right? There's fear, insecurities and doubts, did I do enough? Did I not do enough? The lie of, of negativity of, okay, you, 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 you could have done more or whatever nonsense that is. When, and this goes to mostly the people listening who have already had to survive um, some type of an assault. And, you know, I don't differentiate violence is violence, Right physical violence, verbal violence, mental violence, it's, it's still, it still scars your body. So the first thing I tell anybody or will tell anybody is a, you did the best you could with what you knew at that moment. Everybody's a Monday morning quarterback and we're our worst people, but I could have, should have, would have didn't. And I think that's unfair because at that exact moment, at that exact second that you did whatever you did or didn't do whatever you did, that's where you were at that time. And to find the forgiveness of yourself, that that was the best I could do. Now, when you go to court, pray your lawyer pays attention and, and, and you are forthright in in what you did and and this is why I, I have a challenge with instructors who you know when you get an opportunity to escape they teach their students to re-engage you know there's a circle of uh you know a use of force circle there's a circle for that and when the stop the fight is stopped and you've got a chance to escape and you didn't you know now now it's now you are up a creek without a powder so if you're listening to this and you you've had a violent situation and it didn't go the way you wanted it to and you harbor and it's probably been years that you've that you've held on to this i ask you to try this and remember who you were at that time who you are now and how much of that are you allowing from that past to impact you now at this moment and ruin your life right like if you're if you were assaulted and you didn't fight back and you feel like a coward and you feel like you're useless and all that. Just remember who you were back then. You're not the same person. You're, you're, you're going to be changed forever. Do you dwell on the negative or do you do something so that you never have to be in that situation again? I'm not a big believer in, um, I screwed up before. So now I'm going to go overboard and to make sure I never get violated again, I'm going to go and I'm going to hate everything. I'm going to kill everything. And that's not healthy either. What was it that you didn't do? Start there and now find outlets that will help you heal the pain of that moment. Because that's really the chances that you're going to get attacked the exact same way again are so minimal. Really all we're doing when we're trying to, to fix what's happened in the past is we just want to sit there and give ourselves permission to live again. And say, I'm not the same person. I can do better now than I did before. And the hard part is letting go of that old stuff so that you can grow into this newer version of whoever you are. 
Yeah, and I think that mindset carries over so well with just like any other situation we may face mm -hmm. throughout our lives, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I always say that when uh, things go wrong within our lives, it's not a matter of if, it's just really a matter of when. And, you know, sometimes that could even be a result of our own shortcomings just as well, too. I mean, I know, like I said, I'll, I'll raise my hand first on this one. You know, I mean, I haven't always like uh, been the best son. I mean, I fall short in some of my friendships and, you know, I've made mistakes in my career. You know, I've made mistakes in like other areas uh, just as well, too. But of course, mm -hmm. it's just... um you know, and maybe I'll be hard on myself at first, but I also just have to remember, it's just like, okay, you know what? You screwed up. It's not the end of the world. You're still alive. And as you're, and if you're still alive, then you can work towards learning from that situation and trying to make that situation better. And of course, you know, we're talking in like the realm of violence here, but I do think that, you know, with any other um, instance we may face in our lives that are inevitably going to happen, this mindset carries very well into those just as well. Agreed. Agreed. And, and for, and again, that's where it circles back to loving yourself where you're at, not where you want to be. And where you want to be is in this moment right now, not in tomorrow and definitely not in yesterday. Right. And mm -hmm. forgiveness is a real thing. You know, I know many, many people, myself included, carry things for 25, 30 years. It's a long time to carry it. And, and that, and the beautiful part is that's not a man thing. That's not a woman thing. It's just a human thing. Right. Right. So hopefully this conversation will spark just enough of a wedge of something positive in the gap of negativity that you've got between common sense and good. And then the negativity, there's a gap swimming, man. And you just, you need to let that go. And it takes time and it's an onion, man. It really is. It's an onion. Forgiveness is an onion. Every time you think that you're, you know, you're doing good at something, all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, man, something happens and I get triggered and I'm back to where I was. And I want people to understand, I, I used to have a real problem with the word triggered because it was just used all the time. And then I had this, really this revelation that triggers, and again, my faith is massive for me. So for some people that have a challenge with my faith, you're just going to have to listen to what I have to say because it applies to you. Just you may not like the verbiage, but triggers are just God's way of showing you what you need to work on. Mm. Right. Like you're triggered about this. OK, I got some work to do on that subject then. And it's not, oh, man, I suck. It's OK. At least now I know what I got to work on. All right. And walk towards whatever it is that you're triggered about, because that's your that, there's your healing, man. That's your healing. You got to walk towards your healing. You cannot walk away from your healing. And that shows you can talk to anybody who's gone through any kind of tragedy. They will be the first to say that when they walked away from it, it just, it just got interest, man. It just became a big tsunami. Just go towards it. And it's going to suck. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And all the, you know, all the little motivation words, just walk towards it. Just lean into it. And this is where, you know, for my faith is a big deal because I'm not alone. And if you're not in any faith, then reach out and don't be, don't be that man or woman that's like, try to do it on their own. Reach out, tell somebody, hey, man, I, I got to walk into this storm and I just need somebody that I can bump up next to, right? I got Jesus. I got guardrails that, to bounce me back and forth. Grab a human being and be like, I'm running into a storm. I need, I need, I need and say, because that's what you do. It's not, I would like, I need someone's presence there so I can weather this storm head on. Yeah. You know, my faith and, and many times in the past has kind of been on shaky ground. You know, God and I, you know, we've had a complex relationship throughout the 38 years that I've been on uh, this planet. We're on good terms now. Uh, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, it's just like for the longest time, whenever I was faced with a difficult situation, you know, I think sometimes when people run into that, you know, a lot of things that they ask, they will ask God is why me, you know, why, yeah. why is this being allowed to like, you know, to happen to me? It's like, are you punishing me? Did I do something wrong? It's just like, why God, why? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I think, but now I look at it differently, Marcus. And, um, I think to myself, um, 
okay, Lord, I'm not sure, you know, um, what, what, the, what you're trying to show me here, but I know you're up to something. So I'm going to really just try to take whatever lesson you're trying to teach me and move forward. It's just like, um, I'm confused right now, I will say, but I will leave it in your hands and um, I will make the best that I can out of the situation and try to gain whatever lesson you're trying to teach me here, even if I don't see it right away. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so I yes. certainly resonate with you, with you there. Um, now, has uh, faith always kind of been a part of your life or did you find it oh. later on? No, much later. Like, uh, what year are we in right now? 2024? 2024, yeah. 2021. Mm. I can't believe this. Yeah, I spent spent most of my teenage years and adult life working for the enemy. Mm. Was there kind of... What was there kind of sort of like a big, like a aha moment, I guess I'll say that sort of uh, brought you to your faith or was it maybe a collection of things or? No, it was, it was very simple. Um, uh, the Coles notes version is, is I got my divorce from my second wife and I ran away to Arizona to, to, because I was ashamed that uh, here I am second divorce, man, what kind of loser am I? And, and I can see now that God took me and said, Hey, let's get you to Arizona. Cause I need you alone so I can work on you. And he'd been working on me, softening my heart a little bit. And then uh, a guy who used to work for me, John Thomas, uh, he's an evangelist, his father and mother were always at our school, right? They, every test, they were just always there. And his mom was just truly an angel on earth. And uh, 2021 in the summer, uh, John Thomas was in, uh, in Arizona. He came by and he said, hey, I just want you to know that my mom died of a stroke. And, you know, death is not new for me. Okay, that's when you've tasted death enough times, you kind of just be like, okay, well, and then you start to try to think of nice things of the person that died. Um, that one hit me like I got shot in the belly with uh, rock salt. I, I was gutted. Um, you've been to the UK, so you've heard that term before. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I was gutted. And the very first thought that came to my mind is, what if I don't see her in heaven? And that was it. That was it. That And that was the moment that God was like, there you go. And then I went home, uh, I got on the internet, found a ticket to go from Arizona to Fort Worth, December of that year, um, because I knew I was going to get dunked. And the only person that was going to dunk me was going to be her husband, Jay Louvier, who's been in faith for 50 years. And I was like, I'm coming in December and you're going to dunk me. And and even with that, I want to make sure people are like, OK, great. What? So all of a sudden you had the aha moment. I've, I've been growing in my, my relationship with Jesus after that. It wasn't like I got dunked and came out and angels harped and it was like, Ooh. you know, I've still felt the same. Everything felt the same, but God was working inside, transforming old want to's into his want to's. And, and it's been a, it's been a magnificent uh, relationship that I have. And this is the thing, you know, I don't, I don't harbor, you know, you don't, you don't believe in Jesus. Cool, man. All right. He believes in you. Right. Like, right. you know, I don't, I hold God's hand, but it's him that holds my hand. He's the one who never left me and never forsake me. I look back at, at my decades, like being molested by, in, by two different men. He was there. Now people will be like, well, how, why would God let that happen? I don't believe God lets things happen. However, he will turn a tragedy into a triumph. And now I'm having conversations with men and women in having a freedom and getting rid of fear and getting rid of the enemy's hooks about how the shame and guilt that comes with all that nonsense, everything that's been shenanigans, I almost cussed, uh, everything <laughs> that in my life, God has sat there and I've been able in, in the last two or three years, and I've been doing that a little bit before, but to be able to speak freely and openly about them to show that, you know what, it's okay. You're a human being. You bleed crap and cry just like everybody else. You're not that special. The only good special thing is that Jesus loves you and wants a relationship with you. That's it. Simple. Done. Yeah. You know, I, I've kind of sort of was reignited in my faith uh, so, somewhat around like the same time, maybe a little bit uh, sooner. Um, I'm going back to around like uh, 27 here. Um, now, initially, I was raised uh, in the Catholic Church. And right. um, when I you know, graduated from high school and I moved away from my small uh, town in rural Michigan, um, I joined the military. I joined the Marine Corps like right out of high school. And when I say right out of high school, I'm talking like three weeks after I walked across the stage at high school graduation, I was on a plane to San Diego to start boot right. camp. So uh right. And then I think during like 
those early adult years, I kind of sort of fell out uh, from the church. I mean, I'd find my way back in like, you know, on occasion, but I, I think ultimately it's just, again, I, I kind of let myself get a little bit of a stray with uh, my relationship with God. And as I started experiencing things, you know, there was a few things then, you know, m- my own mindset that kind of drove a wedge in our relationship too. Like uh, I also joined uh, the Peace Corps um, a little bit later on and I was uh, living in a small village in uh, West Africa for two years. And, you know, I just remembered like looking at the people of this village and, you know, you brought up the point about how, you know, comparison is the thief of, is the thief of joy. And, you know, I found myself doing that a lot, like kind of thinking about my own like st- cultural standards and kind of like sort of placing it over them where it's like they didn't have like electricity, running water, high speed Internet, all these like, you know, things that, you know, many of us take for granted here in the first world. And so I thought to myself, like why 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 does why does God allow them to like not have all these things when I and so many other uh, people have like these things and uh, and but then once I kind of sort of uh, you know thought it thought in the way that you just described where it's just like uh, you know God creates these situations and and brings people up in in ways that we may not expect or we may not see right away. I mean yes these uh, these kids didn't have video games and all these like fancy toys that I had growing up, but I can't think of a whole lot of uh, instances where I didn't see those kids smile like every yep. single day. Yep. Like Straight they, up. they, they were just so happy, like just seeing them play, like they would do this thing where they would take a stick and like um, a bicycle tire and then like try mm-hmm. to get the tire to spin around the compound. It's just, yep. and um, my mother bless her heart. She she asked me. She says, "Can I send a, a bunch of uh, toys uh, for the kids there? Can I bring like jump ropes and frisbees and all this like sort of stuff?" And then I said, um, "Well, thanks, mom, but um, I, I don't think maybe we should uh, bring anything to them because I'm seeing how happy the, these kids are, and I'd feel like I would disrupt that if I tried to, like I said, impose my own like uh, first world standards, uh, right. you know, on these people and." So now fast forwarding a little bit to 2007, I had just finished grad school and um, I had just getting through a bad breakup and I was kind of sort of like adrift in my life. I didn't have like a direction or a purpose right away. And I went to go visit my grandmother and I was uh, who at this time was a widow, like my grandfather had passed away just a few years prior. And um, and I was telling her, I'm like, grandma, I'm I'm kind of a. Uh, lost right now. I mean, I'm not sure really what to do or what to do next and and everything like that. And uh, she says, well, you know, if you feel lost, just turn to the Holy Spirit and you'll be able to find your way. And and Marcus, uh, this was the last conversation I've ever had with my grandmother before she passed away. And so, and obviously there was a reason why my last conversation with, with my grandma was on that topic. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's what really kind of, uh, you know, helped me and, and uh, the Lord get on good terms again and, and carry our relationship forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm so happy that you got to have that conversation. And I'm, I'm happy for her that she knew that, you know, no matter what, she got to take her grandson and just give him a little reminder that, uh, that, that, that there's somebody that loves you, you know. I think that that's, oh, that's wonderful. That is truly wonderful. And I want to make sure, like, the the people that are listening, regardless of where you stand in your life, you've had church hurt, you're an atheist, whatever your beliefs are, cool. I ask only to remember one thing, that we leave God. God never leaves us, right? And it's important that people understand that human beings do bad things. There's good people. There's bad people. There's social people. There's always, there's always going to be something to do that, but God is always good all the time. All the time. God is good. When you look at your life and scenarios and if you, and it, it comes down to your heart, when you're angry and you're dark and you're just constantly just not in a good space, It's difficult for God to sit there and be like, look, I'm going to sit there and help this kid out. But no matter how dark we get, he's right beside us. Just sitting there being like, look, I just need you. Give me just a little bit of a, just a, just open up a little bit and I can, I can do some work, but he's not going to go in uninvited. 
you know, and I try to tell every single person this, there's no right or wrong with, with following Jesus. Just say, Hey man, I need a friend. I need some help. And let, and just be open to talking to him the same way I'm talking. This is how I pray every single day. I talk to him. He's my best friend. I talk to him. Hey man, what's going on? Am I going to, when I'm on this podcast, please just speak through me. Don't let my nonsense words come out. Just speak through me. So I speak your words, not mine, because your will is way better than mine. It's not all the lies that you've been told. It's not having to go to church every Sunday and every Easter and having to do this and having to do that. It's a choice, man. I get to sit there and have a relationship with somebody who will never leave me or abandon me or forsake me. And if you've ever had trust issues in your lifetime, I know there's people listening who are like, yep, hands up. I, I got trust issues and then some. It's very cool to have someone love you and will never leave you and never and just forgive you for being an idiot because we're idiots. We're human beings. We were born flawed, man. Cut yourself some slack. I'm not saying and I'm not saying it's OK to go and act like an idiot. Like, don't don't think I'm all like, woohoo. OK, I'm just going to say one more thing and let's move on because I'm on a, on a roll here. Sure. Grace and mercy. Grace is the good that we don't deserve that we get anyways. And mercy is the bad that we most definitely deserve that we don't receive. And those things are from Jesus. And and that alone is my number one selling feature to myself on the fact that I am loved by a person who died for my sins. And no matter how bad I get, he's going to sit there and be like, okay, you saw that didn't work. Let's, let's try, let's try something else. And the transformation is a real deal inside, man. Old want to's versus new want to's. And my new want to's are in line with him. And my old want to's are in line with an unhealthy lifestyle. And and there you go. Thank you for coming to my Ted talk. All right. All right. Well, um, yes, not to entirely leave uh, the subject, though, but I also wanted to ask you, like, um, as we were connecting, uh, was this also probably around the same time where um, you started your sobriety journey? Because I know you've been on that journey for a good while, uh, just as well, too. No, I, uh, I've i been sober now nine years. This year is nine years. Uh, I, that was so 2015. So, no, I was not walking with the Lord during that time. I just stopped drinking because I knew that I had never had any good memories with drinking. And I, right. And so, so my ex-wife and I, we both just sat there and uh, May 24th, I think that's the date. I'm so bad with dates. Um, we just were like, we'd gotten hammered the night before. And, and there's just such a crummy feeling having to look at my phone. And I'm like, okay, so who do I have to apologize to? What stupidity did I do? And the sh- guilt and shame. And we both look, I said, I don't want to do this no more. And she goes, I don't want either. And so we poured out any alcohol and, that was it. I didn't drink again. I went to my first meeting like three years ago. Uh, a buddy of mine, I was in Minnesota doing some teaching and he was like, Hey, you want to go to a meeting? I'm like, yeah, sure, man. Let's go. Never been to one before. Um, and a lot of people who work programs have a challenge. They're like, you know, what do you mean you didn't work a program? That's not to say, and I want to make sure we're clear about this because when it comes to sobriety or dealing with an addiction, my ability to quit alcohol, that wasn't the real addiction. Okay. So I quit alcohol. I didn't drink at all. Nothing. It was easy peasy. It was like, man, look at me. I'm, I'm pat myself on the back until I found out what real addiction is porn. Okay. So having to cut that out and, and the, here's what an addiction is for those who are, you know, I've had people who are like, well, I have no addictive personality whatsoever. Okay. Well then you don't understand what it's like to do a thing that you don't want to do that, you know, is bad for you. And you're like, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it today. I'm not going to do it. Today. I can do it. I'm, one day, one day, I'm not going to do it. And 15 minutes later, you're doing that thing. And you say that over and over about 50, 60, 70 times in a day. It, and for me, it doesn't matter what the addiction is. I don't care what it is. Regardless of whether it's a drug, an alcohol, uh, gambling, infidelity, porn, whatever it is, it's from the enemy. And it's a challenge to go every day and, and just feel like, a, and to do that without feeling like a bag of shit. 
you know? And so one thing that this, my walk in this walk is my empathy for addicts has completely changed because when I was drinking, I was like, what do you mean? Stop drinking, man. I did it. My ex-wife did it. It's easy. It's all in the brain. You can do it. And then the Lord was like, okay, let me show you where your addiction really is. And let me show you how difficult it is since you're so great at change and stopping things. Let's see. Now you're going to look and now you're going to see what fentanyl really is like and what heroin really is like. Because at the end of the day, it's something that destroys you and it destroys the relationships of anybody you're with. Now, I can say porn has ruined my entire life, but it's it porn is the it's the thing. Whatever the root problem is, you got to find out where the root is, what caused that root to explode, and then your addiction is easier to deal with once you get to the root of it. Because if you just sit there and go to the problem, the problem, the problem, you're going to be fighting every day, you know. And uh, and I say that because there's men and women that are addicted to things on this earth and feel hopeless because they cannot they cannot stop whatever the thing is find the root and that's the hard part right i think we can agree finding the root means that means i got to tear away at stuff and find out where it comes from so that i can take that root out and replant it with something that's healthy and positive and if I may add to that too, it's also, I think, where maybe a lot of people fall short, and I am speaking from personal experience here, is uh, I tried to fight addiction alone. And mm-hmm. um, and I think, yeah. uh, you know, and and th- that it, one thing that really keeps um, a lot of people from opening up to others about their addiction is, you know, the guilt, the shame, yeah. like you yeah. mentioned too. It's like, we mm-hmm. don't want people to know the side of ourselves. And yes. um, but we, But we know that when we engage in these behaviors behind closed doors, we do them behind closed doors because, you know, we don't want people to see us like that and everything. So um, now I, I bring up the analogy, you know, with some of, uh, you know, the men that I've aligned with, um, you know, who are also facing like addiction in certain things is that I say, if you're trying to battle addiction by yourself, you're fighting a demon in the dark and mm-hmm. in darkness, demons have home field advantage. But when you get other people in the, to fight alongside you, they bring light into that darkness and if you can see the enemy you can fight the enemy better with their help and also going back to like i said this is why i didn't want to totally walk away from our topic of faith here is that you know bringing god into the fight just as well too helped uh pretty significantly uh for me as well so that's probably what i would add uh, to this uh, conversation is that uh you know don't fight this fight alone i mean there are you know people out there that you can confide in that will help you with your addiction whatever it is because Whatever you're dealing with right now, someone else has dealt with this um, or is dealing with it at the current moment. And I think that's another uh, mindset that you know many people would have if they're dealing with addiction is that they think that they're the only ones in the world who are dealing with this right now. And the reality is, no, they're not. There are other people out there that are dealing with it just as much as you are. And so it's like, you know, get them in the fight as well. You know, have them help you. You help them you know, exchange ideas, what's worked, what hasn't, and, uh, you know, just fight hard. Yeah. And I, th- you know, so when it comes to darkness and light, I have to say that because I, you know, I live most of my life in the dark, right? Like it's, that's, that's, that's comfortable for me is, is working. The enemy loves the dark mm-hmm. and something that resonates deeply with me is when I am in the dark, I have a light inside of me. God's light is inside of me and I I am fully on board with reaching out finding finding someone who you can just be you with about this subject now when you go to look for somebody there's a whole bunch of fear that comes with it I'm going to be judged they don't know what I've gone through they don't know what I've done They won't like me because of what I've done, because we all have the dark things inside that nobody needs to know about. And as you're searching for someone, if you're listening to this, this is the time that that really get in tight with God about, okay, put somebody in my life. And as I start to do what I'm doing, just give me strength and thank you for your forgiveness. Like the big thing is when people ask me about my relationship, I'm like, I just said thanks. Thank you 
for giving me the strength for this moment. Thank you for, 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 for everything that I'm doing. And thanks for your patience. Okay. Um, let's see. Where, where did we leave off, sir? We well, talked basically about, I was just saying about the reason I'm so open about everything when it comes to any kind of addiction is the guilt and the shame lie is what stops people from being able to heal from whatever it is that's caused the the addiction. So I'm just going to always be really loud and open about it. And I'm not saying that anybody else has to be that way, but I'm for sure going to sit there and show that the enemy's got no power over, over me. I still fight with my addiction every single day and I still go to God and I still trying to work on the stuff inside. And the fact is, is if you just sit there and are more open about it, the lie that the enemy tells you has no power. So there's that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and you're right. I think, um, th this is always going to be an ongoing battle, you know, I mean, even though we get to like a certain point where, you know, we definitely have the upper hand, there's always going to be like the enemy is always going to try to nudge us in some way, put temptations like, you know, in front of us, especially again, when we have these moments of like weakness every now and then, then when we have those doubts, we have that shame, we have those fears, you know, that's when, you know, the enemy wants to come after us when he thinks that we're at our most vulnerable and just be like, yeah. oh, well, you know, here, this will make you feel better, you know, and everything yeah. like that. But lies, all lies. Yeah. yeah, all lies. And that's and really all we can do is as fellow human beings is have empathy and compassion for tough to people, things that people are going through tough things and just understand that we bleed crap and cry just like everybody else. And ain't nothing special about us. Just be have empathy for your fellow human being. All right. Absolutely. All right. So we are recording kind of towards uh, the end of uh, July here, but what do you have on uh, the horizon uh, for the next of this, this year, Mark, or excuse me, the rest of this year? Um, like, I, I think at this point you're kind of like retired from like the far away going across the world, traveling and instructing, but um, like, what do you got um, on the horizon? Um, a couple of things. I, uh, in S September and October have just been a plethora of, of, I've got stuff lined up. Uh, I've got a thing in Virginia, Operation Yellow Tape. A friend of mine, Kenny uh, Kenny Jr., Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Mitchell Jr. Um, it's all about mental health awareness. A lot of times for first responders and with the suicide rate that we have going on. So good talking about, I'm going to talk about mental health and what have you. And then I'm doing a little bit of teaching, you know, a little bit of high ass stuff, a little work workshop. Uh, there's a men's revival that I'm doing in Oklahoma. Uh, and again, uh, some teaching as well. That's basically what I do now is I will talk, you know, same way I'm talking to you, uh, and then do some, some teaching stuff. I've got a teammate of mine, uh, uh, Brolick, uh, Crystal Stokes. She helps me a lot with the family stuff, uh, that we teach, like personal protection for a family, uh, you know, when sometimes an option of a gun isn't your best option uh, and giving giving just helpful tools for men, women and children to be able to not worry so much about violence. Um, I've got a couple of books coming out. I've got one. Hopefully uh, the editor's on it right now. So whenever she finishes with it, then we'll go to uh, look at it getting published. But I have two others that are just basically sitting, waiting for this one to publish and then wait a year and throw the other ones out. Um, but that's what I do for the most part. Now, I do, I still teach. I still do teach. It's just a little more selective. Like I do, I'll work with security groups or a church or, you know, if you've got a group of people that are all going to become working with uh, in the executive protection industry, I'll be flown in to work with the hand to hand stuff to give them options in that environment. So I still teach. I'm just not as, um, just not as, it's just not my definition of who I am anymore. And even with Krav Maga, Krav Maga is still a major part of everything that I teach and it always will be. Um, but I really consider myself like the, the gateway drug to self defense. I'll go and teach some stuff, get you feeling like you know what you're doing. Good. Now there's a Muay Thai school over there. There's some wrestling. You want to do some jujitsu, do some jujitsu, 
do something, get some knife training, get some gun training. Like I just show you how easy it is for you to start the process process um, and then make it a part of your lifestyle. All right. Outstanding. And where can um, our listeners and our viewers go to uh, connect with you and also to be, to kind of be kept in the loop when your books do come out down the line? Um, social media is still like Facebook and Instagram are, are probably the easiest ways. Um, I do have a website. Uh, it's, it's under construction because we're transformed. It's transitioning into a different version of me. Um, when I put it up before it was when I was in Clint Emerson's hundred deadly skills, mm. uh, book, which if you have, if you want one book for self-defense, go buy that book, Clint Emerson's hundred deadly skills, combat edition. It's got about 20 instructors. I'm one of them. And there's little QR codes that go to the, the videos of each technique that's in the book. It gives you a great understanding and options. I highly recommend it. Um, so I usually say my website, but since that's kind of transitioning, Instagram uh, and Facebook, best way to go. All right. And I'll get everything linked up in the show notes uh, for this episode. Or if our viewers are watching us talk on YouTube, it'll be down in the description below so they can find uh, everything there. All right. Well, Marcus, as we start uh, winding down here, um, there's a couple of uh, standard questions that I like to ask all my guests towards the end of the show. And uh, now you've kind of, we've kind of already had you do this uh, throughout this episode, and one and it is to issue a challenge uh, to our listeners because you know we got to get some information from you, we got to get some great insights and hear some good stories from you. But I always say that you know information, stories, insights can only take our listeners and our viewers so far action has to follow up to go out there and do um, uh, amazing things. So with that, what challenge would you issue to our listeners today for them to go out there and start living a more adventurous life? Um, I think my biggest challenge for everybody that's listening is to do more for others than you do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do a random act of kindness. And that doesn't have to mean money. Like we're so caught up in money, money, money. Just, doing something like opening the door for a woman who's got 12 kids, you know, and keeping it open. Um, yeah, it'd be great if you, you know, tip a little more to the person who's going through a tough time, show, show empathy and kindness, but do something more for someone else than for yourself. And, and don't do it just once. See how many times in a day you can do it. And you'd be amazed at how many opportunities you get. Absolutely. And like you mentioned, those don't have to be big things or you spending a ton of money, just small no. things like, um, you know, e even if I may, I can just think of an example just from uh, today. Uh, you know, I was uh, checking out at HEB, get, doing my weekly grocery haul. And uh, when I went up to the cashier, um, I addressed him by his name because he had his name tag on. And he just like his, his you know, it, his ears perked up a little bit because I don't know if anyone really even thinks to do that, like actually address a cashier by his or her name, yes. right? You know, because yeah. it's like, uh, I, I feel like a lot of people just might like look at cashiers as a means to an end rather than an actual person. Um, but I just humanized him just by calling yes. him by his first name. And I think that really landed pretty well. Yes. Yes. Everybody deserves to be treated with some dignity. And I would go so far as to say, especially the person who's not being very lovable to you, be lovable back. And that that's harder to do than it, than you think because they are being mean to you. Just remember, and I'm going to say this, when somebody's mean to you, just remember they're not mad at you. They're not being mean to you. They are, there's something hurting big time inside. And if you can just think about the fact that, wow, they're not really mad at me. Like when they cut you off, right? Road rage has nothing to do with that person or with me. They're cutting me off because they were going through it. So empathy and compassion are probably the two things that we have as a gift in, in human in, being humans that we don't, we do not exercise that enough. And it's not hard. It's very easy. Absolutely. All right. So what I have next for you is my final three. Now, these are three uh, um, questions that I think are kind of fun. Um, that may be subjective, <laughs> but um, I'll let you decide on that when you get asked them. And um, all my guests get asked these questions at the end of the show. So you're going to get asked uh, these as well. And okay. the first of these uh, three questions is, what is your favorite place that you've been to so far? Besides Israel, and I, I qualify it besides Israel. Oh, it's tough. Um, Costa Rica and Greece. 
Okay. Now I'm trying to think, um, those might be uh, original uh, answers to this question, Marcus. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else uh, that I've asked this question has said Costa Rica or Greece. I don't think so. So we Beautiful. may be um, we may be like one for one for original answers to these questions. So uh, All right, that's really good. But I have a couple more for you. And the second uh, question in this final three is: What is one thing on your bucket list that you have yet to do? One thing I have left to do. There's uh, there's a significant amount, but I think uh, I would have to say oh, that's a that's a really good question because of the fact that I've I've done a a lot of things. Bucket list. Oh, buddy. Okay, let's let's go to the next one and then let come back to this one because I I need to needs to stuff has to come to the front of my head. Very well. All right. So uh, the the last question in this final three, and this is a two parter. What is your favorite animal, and have you seen this animal in the wild? Favorite animal. My favorite animal, I have to say just one, because you always think about an animal of like, would you like to play with them? You know, mm. like, and I, even though just big cats, you know, big cats, like just the power of, of big cats, you know, lions, cheetahs, panthers. Um, and I have seen them in the wild, but I have yet to see them in their domain. There's a an organization that I, I I will be doing more work with called Vet Paw, and they're in uh, South Africa and Africa. And their job is to protect indeed like rhinos that are left from hunters and, and from the people that get kill animals for their tusks and what have you. Um, and I know they allow people to come over to see the operation and you get close to those animals and seeing them in in action. So, my favorite animal would be um, like a big cat. Now, my favorite animal as a pet, I've always been big on skunks. Skunks, I've always, yeah, and really? I've, yeah. And there's a lady that has one in Virginia where I'm going to teach, um, and they're you know they snipped or whatever. Uh, and I've just always want because I heard they're, they're the perfect blend between a dog and a cat. So if I could have a skunk, that'd be pretty cool. All right. Skunk is definitely an, an original answer uh, to, to, the, to this question, mo most okay. certainly. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize that you could, um, I guess, uh, take away their capabilities to, uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's a defense yeah. mechanism. Yeah. And, and, and if they're in, like, I guess, like a loving home, there's really no need yeah. for a defense yeah. mechanism like that, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah. that's interesting. I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Now, you said this was a two-part question? Well, I mean, well, as if you've seen them in the wild okay. before. Yeah, the and part. I and I have, I've seen skunks, but uh, <laughs> not <laughs> not not and here in Texas, but I I don't get close. Um, now you asked about a bucket list, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, this one's this one's gonna hurt um, because bucket list we we think of things really they're accomplishments, right? There's something we want to accomplish. Um, and, and a bucket list for me would have been having a grandchild. Mm. Um, I won't get a grandchild uh, in my lifetime, meaning that my son, because of his condition, he like he's the la I'm the last of my bloodline. He when he I die and he dies, that's it. We're, we're gone. Um, and there's just something about becoming a grandparent uh, or a great grandparent even if you're blessed. Um, so for me, that's a bucket list thing that I would love to achieve. Um, knowing that it's unlikely, unlikely to happen. But that was what came to my head when you asked the question. Um, there's cool things to do, you know, bungee jumping, all that kind of stuff. I've jumped out of planes and that's cool. But bucket list of checking off and being like, yeah, I'm glad that that happened. Uh, I, would, I would pick uh, having a grand, grandchild. And I don't want this to be negative. Like it's not, it's, it's just that's what came to my heart. And so that answers your question. Well, we are certainly three for three for original answers uh, to the to these questions, Marcus. So 
bravo <laughs> on, on that front, <laughs> like, <so. laughs> awesome all right well marcus uh that's it man that that's all the questions uh that i have for you today but before we uh call it a day here let's just recap one more time where our listeners and our viewers can go to uh connect with you where they can find uh, the books um when they're out and things like that what do you got for us well, Instagram, it's my name, Marcus Torgerson, one uh, that you can't, you can't miss me. Uh, Facebook has two pages. There's, there are all my stuff is public, right? So, you know, there's a, a, a business page, I guess, again, Marcus Torgerson. And then there's a regular page I've had for a decade and a half. Uh, Marcus Torgerson, my face is on it. You can't miss it. Um, and my website is just www.marcustorgerson.com. And uh, all information regarding books and newsletters that will be coming out, all that kind of stuff uh, will be in either those social media platforms or when the, I find a website person that will uh, fit nicely with me, then we'll have the information bombarded there. All right. And like I mentioned, I'll have all those linked up in the show notes for this episode. Or again, if our, we have viewers on YouTube, it'll be in the description below for them to go click away and find everything. All right. Well, Marcus, I want to thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, for, for joining me tonight. You know, again, it's a small world. You and I have mutual connections, and I'm glad that we were able to uh, connect ourselves and uh, get this conversation going today. So, yeah, thank you very much for being here and sharing your stories and insights with myself and the listeners. It's been great. Well, thank you. It's uh, It's been a real joy, real joy to have this opportunity. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Likewise. Right on, sir.